Hello, this is Dr. Jeff Tarrant, director of the Neuromeditation Institute, and I wanted to welcome you to this introduction to neuromeditation, this brief mini course where we will be looking at some of the science and methods behind our approach to a brain based meditation for mental health. So, a good place to start is defining what we mean when we use the term meditation. So for us, the definition we use is a systematic mental training designed to challenge habits of attending, thinking, feeling, and perceiving. And this is obviously a generic definition, but it really does encompass the primary thing that you're doing with any style of meditation. You are learning to pay attention to your own internal processes in a different way than you normally do. And when you engage in that type of process, you are undoing some of the automatic, habitual, normal ways that you pay attention in the world. And of course, where we're going with this is some of the automatic processes actually cause us distress. They lead us to feel anxious or depressed. So if we can change those, then that is a primary way that you can start to change the way that the mind works and that the mind engages with both your internal process and with the external world. Now, we know from lots of research that's been conducted over the past 20 years in particular that meditation works. And what I mean by that is that meditation can be used as an effective strategy to reduce a whole laundry list of concerns, particularly in the mental health realm. So this list that I have on the slide is not supposed to be completely comprehensive, but it is a list of things that we feel confident about from the research literature. So if you just take a quick look at this, stress, depression, various forms of anxiety, um, you know, eating disorders, but then you'll also see some things that we normally associate or consider physical concerns as well. So things like hypertension and hot flashes. And really this, I think, highlights the fact that we are a mind-body. These things go together. If you influence one, you influence the other. So we know that meditation can be used to have a positive impact on all these things. So that's good news. That's good news for all of us. Uh, the tricky part is that there's a lot of different kinds of meditation. How do you know which one to use? Which one is going to guide you toward the outcomes that you're looking for? So not all meditations are the same. And this is really an important concept that we talk a lot about. It's treated this way in a lot of the research and in a lot of different books or self-help programs. But if you just take a look at some of the names that are used in the research with meditation, you'll see a wide variety of different styles. And even within each of these, there may be multiple different approaches to meditation. So even within a particular tradition, so let's say looking at this list, Vipassana. Well, if you go to a Vipassana class or a workshop or a retreat, you're likely to do several different forms of meditation. It's not just one thing. So this starts to make the field a bit confusing. Like, how do you really know what you're doing? And how do you know if what you're doing is going to lead to the desired outcomes? So this is why what we have done is kind of looked at all the research literature and categorized meditations into four primary styles. Now, we also talk about a fifth style sometimes, but really most approaches can be put into one of these four little boxes. And the categories that we use are called focus, mindfulness, open heart, and quiet mind. And these categories are based on how you are directing your attention and what your intention is. So, Briefly, looking at these four styles, what are we talking about? Well, focus is kind of one of the most basic forms of meditation that most people are going to be familiar with. Sometimes it's called a concentration practice. 
where you're essentially choosing one target for your attention. It might be the breath, might be a mantra, could be an image, and you're holding your attention on that one thing. When the mind wanders, you recognize the mind wanders and you get it back. So any meditation that has that basic formula fits into the category of focus. And what's interesting is regardless of which particular target you're using, there are some basic mechanisms in the brain that are the same because the basic process is the same. So we can take all of those different styles and kind of put them in one category. Now, mindfulness, this obviously is a term we're using a lot in our culture right now, and it's being used rather loosely to describe and define a lot of different approaches to meditation. In fact, a lot of people are using the term mindfulness as a synonym for meditation. We're using it slightly differently. We're using mindfulness in a particular way to talk about a particular style and approach to meditation. So this approach is really a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. So can you be aware of what's happening in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your body, with your breath? Allow it to be there just as it is without changing it, without modifying it, without attachment, without pushing away things you don't like, and then letting it go. This is kind of the basic formula for mindfulness in the way that we're talking about it. And you can hear even in that definition that it's different than focus. It's a different approach. Now, focus and mindfulness often go together, which is great, but there's a different process involved and there's different brain mechanisms involved. The third category is open heart. Now, we're using this term as a little bit of an umbrella to encompass things like loving kindness and compassion but also meditation styles that are focused on things like gratitude or forgiveness. So it's a little bit broader than just loving kindness and compassion. The basic idea is any meditation style where the goal is to intentionally activate a positive emotional state and then do something with that. So you might be sending those feelings to yourself sending them out to others in your environment, people that you care about, people that maybe you don't care about. So any meditation style that has that basic formula fits into this category. And again, there's gonna be some similarities in terms of how the brain is engaged and activated when you are activating these positive emotional states. The fourth style is quiet mind. This is another one of those sort of stereotypical ideas about meditation, that somehow you're supposed to sit down and get rid of all the thoughts in your head, that the mind is empty and it's spacious. Now, one of the things that should be obvious already is there are other ways to meditate that don't involve a quiet mind. So everything we've already discussed, you're doing something with your attention and with your intention and there are styles of meditation that try to help you achieve that state where there is minimal activity going on in the mind. So these are meditation styles like Zen or Transcendental Meditation. So we talk about this as sort of a spacious awareness. So these are the four basic styles of meditation that we teach and we talk about. Now. Which style should you choose? Well, it depends. What are your goals? So this list is a starting point to start to look at that question. Why do you wanna meditate? What's the point? Are you wanting to meditate to improve your sleep or to reduce stress and anxiety or to improve your mood? Depending on what your goal is, you might choose a different meditation style. So. For example, focus meditation is going to be ideal if you are hoping to increase the functionality of your frontal lobes. Well, what are your frontal lobes doing? Executive functions, paying attention, self-monitoring, improving your focus. Certain kinds of other cognitive skills like reaction time, working memory. So 
the reason that focus is so good for these particular types of skills is because you're exercising your frontal lobe. You know, we know that the brain is a use it or lose it system. If you exercise certain mechanisms, they get stronger and the skills associated with those brain regions get stronger as well. So focus might be particularly good if you're struggling with ADHD or cognitive decline or maybe a mild traumatic brain injury. So this is kind of the, the basic starting point for a lot of meditation strategies. And you'll see that focus becomes important, actually, as a foundation for all of the other styles. Now, mindfulness is particularly good for managing stress and anxiety. Why? Well, if we look at what you're doing in mindfulness, you can see that it's a perfect counterbalance to what happens with stress and anxiety. So with stress and anxiety, we tend to be overly engaged, connected to certain thoughts, feelings, body sensations, right? You can think about worry. What is worry? Worry is, generally speaking, repeating the same thought over and over and over again. You become attached to that thought. You're stuck in that thought process, looping. With mindfulness, what you're learning to do is step back into an observer role, be aware of those thought processes. And in so doing, you can stop that circular process. You can get out of that attachment to those feelings and thoughts. So it's not a big surprise that mindfulness is really known for its relationship to stress and anxiety. In fact, one of the biggest programs is mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's even in the name that that's what you're using mindfulness for. Open heart shouldn't be a big surprise what this is good for. So if you are working to cultivate more positive emotional states, that is going to be a great counterbalance for negative emotional states. So if you tend toward depression or resentment or perhaps wanting to enhance your empathy or perspective taking, for others. Open heart is perfect. So what you're probably starting to see is that these styles can serve as a counterbalance to different challenges that we may be experiencing. Now, quiet mind's an interesting one because on the surface, it could be good for just about everything, right? Most of the ways that we get ourselves in trouble is by the brain being overly active. So rumination, brooding, Right? We're thinking too much, we're in our head too much. And so, kind of obviously, if you can quiet that process down, you're probably going to feel better. And in fact, there's lots of evidence that that's true. The tricky part is that for most people, uh, a quiet mind state is pretty difficult to achieve. So we don't wanna just automatically assume that that's gonna be the right match for every single person. The other thing to consider is that if you already have kind of a slow brain pattern, which is what quiet mind facilitates, you may not want to slow it down more. That you could actually end up creating more difficulties for the person. So there's reasons why we might not want to always just use quiet mind. Some of the areas that we put in connection with quiet mind, some of the concerns are areas that have been studied quite a bit and have to do with a overconnection with your identity and your sense of self. So things like substance abuse or eating disorders, if you can learn to quiet that internal chatter, the self-talk that may be problematic, that may be a good way to create a space in your internal process to do something different, to change those habits. So back to our very first slide, changing the habitual ways you think about yourself that you process information, that you perceive the world. Now, one of the things that we've done to try to make this process easier for folks is created a quiz. So the Neuro Meditation Styles Inventory. You can find this on our website. We'll provide a link for you down below so that you can take this short quiz and it will ask you a series of questions. And based on your responses, it will give you a score for each of the four styles. The higher your score, the more likely that that is going to be a style that will be helpful for you. 
So this is a way to kind of like do a quick self check. Or if you happen to be working with other students or clients to help them figure out a starting place. Now, in the big picture, this may not be where you end up. It may not ultimately be the only thing that's going to be useful, but it's a good way to orient toward understanding how what your goals are connect to the meditation style that you're working with.